I will be equally enchanted by Dr. Leonard Schlein. I've had a chance to discover that Dr. Schlein is part of an extraordinary family, accomplished and visionary, many of whom are here with us tonight, and that they embrace the arts and sciences completely and um, fully. He's the author of the, of the unique interdisciplinary text, Art and Physics, Parallel Visions in Space, Time, and Light, a textbook used in many undergraduate classrooms around the world. Many thanks to all of our undergraduates attending the lecture this evening. I promise you will leave this lecture on fire and equally enchanted. I imagine tonight each of you will have thoroughly recoded your genes. Thanks to Dr. Schlein's passion for the luxuriant diversity of English in both his writing and speech. He's a surgeon, educator, inventor, and internationally known author. He grew up in Detroit, Michigan, attended the University of Michigan, and took his MD at Wayne State University School of Medicine. He currently is chairman of the laparoscopic surgery at the California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco, and is an associate clinical professor of surgery at UCSF. He began his writing career in the late 1970s, contributing articles to magazines and newspapers, including our very own LA Times. He's the author of two more critically acclaimed, nationally best-selling and award-winning books. Tonight we'll hear about The Alphabet versus The Goddess, but he's also wrote a very powerful book, Sex, Time, and Power, How Women's Sexuality Shaped Human Evolution. Currently, Dr. Schlein is working on a book entitled Leonardo's Brain, The Right-Left Roots of Creativity. Tonight, each of you will be provoked, and your unique presuppositions about patriarchy and misogyny will be challenged, and perhaps eventually even your genes will be altered. Dr. Schlein, it is a great honor to ask everyone here to join me in welcoming you to Pepperdine University. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know you're all wondering, what are the surgeons doing writing a book about the goddess? How did that come about? So let me give you a little background. Uh, I wrote this earlier book entitled Art and Physics, Parallel Visions in Space, Time, and Light, the thesis of which is that the visionary artist had anticipated the great ideas in science prior to their expression in numbers and equations. The artist used image and metaphor first. And I was very taken with the ideas of Marshall McLuhan, the 1960s media theorist, who coined the phrase, the medium is the message, which is the sort of the light motif of this talk tonight. Now also my background is that I'm a surgeon and I spent many years doing vascular surgery. And one of the major operations of vascular surgery is operating on the carotid arteries to the brain. And I've long been fascinated by the very different functions performed by the right and left hemispheres of the human brain. You know, when a surgeon's driving to work in the morning, and you're thinking about, gee, what am I doing today? Let's say I'm fixing Mr. Jones's hernia is that a right-sided hernia or a left-sided hernia? Yeah. It's very important that you remember which side you're operating on. But if you're operating on somebody's carotid artery in their neck, not only do you have to know which side you're operating on, but you have to know whether they're right-handed or left-handed because very different things are uh, to be expected afterwards when you're uh, examining them. So I always thought that was kind of strange. So uh, with this information, I went on an archaeological tour many years ago uh, to visit Mediterranean sites, and our group had the good fortune to have as its guide this fabulous University of Athens professor who essentially told us the same story wherever we went. She said, you know, these temples that you stand before, whether they're dedicated to Zeus or, uh, say, Apollo or, or Poseidon, these temples were all originally consecrated to a goddess. And then unknown persons, for unknown reasons, reconsecrated them to a god at a later date. Now, there's indisputable archaeological and historical evidence that every single ancient culture in the world, men used to worship women. It's not open to debate. And then women held a very high place in these societies. They, they were high priestesses. They performed sacraments. They, they uh, were warriors. They, they were generals. And then, beginning about 3,000 years ago, the goddess began losing power, and soon the gods started taking over. And then with the start of the uh, three Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they denied that there was the existence of a goddess. So I thought that was very strange. I wanted to try to understand how is it that, as a culture, we went from worshiping uh, a female deity that was the source of all um, life to developing rather hard-edged 
um, patriarchal religions that denied the existence of a goddess. Now, you can go to any bookstore and you'll find the bookshelves are groaning with the various theories put forth as to whatever happened to the goddess, but I'd like to introduce you to a, a different uh, idea tonight. In order to do that, we have to discuss a little anthropology. We are part of a family of animals known as primates, and there are currently, uh, fast disappearing unfortunately, but about 270 different species of primates, and 269 of these primates are vegetarians. And they eat, you know, leaves and shoots and roots and nuts and fruits. And um, vegetarians have it easy because, you see, plants can't run away. So as a result, eating vegetables are pretty simple. And then there is one primate of these 270 <clears throat> that we'll probably leave here tonight, if they already have, and sit down and eat the meal that consists of the flesh of another animal. And that's us. So, um, you know, if you want to eat something that's... Um, live, you have to first uh, chase it, and then you have to kill it, and then you have to um, dress it before you can eat it. And the object of your attention is not particularly interested in being eaten. So you can count on these um, dinners to be put up a very spirited defense to make sure that that doesn't happen. So let us go back three million years ago to the African savanna from which we arose, and let us contemplate our prospects for becoming these dangerous hunters. I mean, here we are, we're about five feet tall, and if you'll notice, we don't have any sharp claws, and we have the big canines, and we're not very strong, and we're not very fast. And yet it is at this moment in time that we're making the decision to enter the predatory sweepstakes. Now, humans like to think that we're very special, and we're finding out more and more that we're not so special. But we do have two physical characteristics that distinguish us from all other animals. One is we are the only heel-to-toe walking animal on the planet. And secondly, we have the largest brain per body size of any other animal. Those two things are incompatible. Nobody knows why we stood up and started walking. I mean, it's, it's a real mystery. I mean, if you took any of the guys here and took their clothes off and parachuted them into the African savanna tomorrow, how long would they last? I mean, what, what land predator could you outrun if it was chasing you? And furthermore, if your wife told you to go out and get dinner, what, what four-footed animal could you run after and catch? So it's not at all clear what the advantages of standing up and starting to walk, but here we are uh, making this fateful decision to enter the predatory sweepstakes and compete with the likes of alligators and big cats and tigers and eagles and wolves. And here we are, three million years later, and we have won the gold medal. The single most dangerous predator on the planet happens to be this creature. There is nobody else that can compete with um, this for sheer uh, ferocity. Now, standing up does some very interesting things. Uh, first of all, you know, the birds and the fish and the mammals and the reptiles, they all move through the world pretty much with their vertebral column horizontal to the earth. But when you stand up, we move with our vertebral column vertical to the earth. So what that means is that we have positioned directly above our anus, a huge mass of intestines so that every person here is at risk for being turned inside out if you go for a stroll after a particularly heavy lunch. <laughs> this is a gravitational hazard that does not exist for any other animal. So if you look at a picture of the human pelvis, it's shaped like a gigantic bowl. And one of its architectural functions is to prevent your guts from falling out your rectum. <laughs> now, as a result, the bony hole in the center of the pelvis in humans is actually very small. Well, after about two million years of wandering around in the underbrush, we happened to notice that our hands were free. And we dimly surmised, if only we had a big brain, we could imagine a weapon that our free hands could brandish, and then we would be really dangerous. And beginning 400,000 years ago, we got our wish. For reasons unknown, our brain underwent this extraordinary hyperinflation, and we added an entire pound of brain tissue. We went from a two-pound brain to a three-pound brain in a very short period of time. Now, on your right, you see a gorilla pelvis. She weighs 200 pounds. She delivers a three-pound infant. On your left, you see a human female who weighs 100 pounds. She delivers a seven-pound infant. This is a problem. <laughs> the human female began to deliver the largest brain baby in all of animaldom. Any woman whose birthed a baby knows that the mismatch between the size of the baby's head 
and the diameter of the birth canal is such a mismatch that it produces a lot of problems delivering birth. There was recently an article in the New York Times that 20 percent of the women in uh, sub-Saharan Africa are dying in childbirth. So evolution to solve this problem, and first to try to solve it by getting around by um, uh, coming up with these clever sleights of hand to thread the baby's head to the eye of the mother's birth canal. And then a catastrophe occurred. <laughs> women started to die in childbirth. I want you to think about this for a minute. There's no other animals where women die in childbirth, the females die in childbirth. I mean, humans have the highest female mortality rate delivering babies of any other species. I mean, fortunately, we live in a, a first world country where this is an extraordinarily rare event, but go out and look at any cemetery prior to the 20th century and look at the dates that women died, and a lot of them died in childbirth. It was a very common occurrence. So you would think, wouldn't you, that we should have gone extinct. I mean, how, how could we have a species where the healthy young mothers delivering their firstborns are dying along with their babies? So you would think that we would have evolved wider-hipped and effectually waddling women or smaller brain babies or go extinct, none of which occurred. So the solution to the problem, that natural selection reached into the baby's brain and ripped out most of the neuronal pathways that tell other animals how to behave at birth. They're called instincts. And the human animal is born with remarkably few instincts. But waiting for the baby on the other side of the mother's pelvic ring of bone are the missing pieces of the baby's brain. They're called culture. And they are held in a net of an astonishing new adaptation called human language. And human language is something so remarkable and so new that it required an entirely different neuronal setup. Now, all vertebrates from fish forward have a bilobe brain. They have a right lobe and a left lobe. And pretty much in all of these other species, one hemisphere does what the other hemisphere does. They're just mirror images of each other. Not so in humans. Even though our hemispheres look alike, they are functionally different. So that the right hemisphere in humans and the left hemisphere perform different functions. And uh, this is remarkable because if you look at the brain, it doesn't look very different. Now, I don't mean to insult any lefties here, but just to keep this, so I don't have to keep qualifying everything I say, let's talk about right-handed people who are left brain dominant. This is the approximate area of the left hemisphere of a righty that is devoted to language. So language has several interesting characteristics. Number one, it's linear and it's sequential. It's one word at a time, one line at a time, one sentence at a time, one paragraph at a time. It's one thing after another. So evolution in the economical manner that it works said as long as we're dedicating this hemisphere and appropriating this neuronal real estate for language, let's put in all the other linear sequential things in that left hemisphere, such as arithmetic and algebra and, and sequence and logic and, and determinism. And I like to think of the left brain as a, as a one at a time brain that it processes information in a one thing after another. It's about time. In contrast to the right hemisphere, which perceives the world all at once as a gestalt. The right hemisphere recognizes patterns. You get to see the parts of the whole. You know, when you stand outside and you look at a tableau, you, you see everything all at once, and then, and then you start to see the relationship of the parts to the whole. You need your right hemisphere to read a map, figure out how to get out of a maze, but its most amazing virtuosity is that it can look at complex, complex images, compound images, and decipher them. The most compound, complex image there is is another human face. I mean, we've all had the experience of walking down the street and seeing somebody we haven't seen in 20 years, and this person has now um, gained weight, and they've got wrinkles, and they're bald, and we look at them and we say, um, that, that, that's my old college roommate, uh, Joe. I mean, we don't look at their nose and then their ears and their eyes. We see it as a gestalt all at once. So recognizing faces, I mean, we say we read people's faces. You can tell when somebody's lying to you or they're nervous. So the information you get from reading somebody's face as they're talking to you is a very important part of communication. So each hemisphere has its own forte and you'll notice that there's nothing in either one of these reciprocal pairs that's superior to the other. 
You have to have a full complement in order to function in the world. But dividing our brains in two didn't simply just double our capacity. It raised it to an infinite degree. And although we use the pronoun I, which is this letter I, to indicate the indivisibility of Leonard Schlein, the truth of the matter is there's actually two people in there. And they each have their own likes and dislikes and opinions about the world. I like to think of the right brain as processing image information and emotions, and the left brain processes language and words. Um, one brain is a one-at-a-time brain devoted to time. The other one is an all-at-once brain devoted to space. Now, bringing a baby into the world that has legs that are this long and useless for walking and no fur to keep it warm presents another set of problems. So natural selection had it built into the human female a uh, set of instincts of nurturing that would keep her engaged with her children for longer and more intensely than any other species on the planet. There is no other animal that if one of its offspring were to call it at 2 a.m. in the morning, 25 years after the date of birth, and say, <laughs> I'm in trouble, would you please come? That they would drop everything and go to the aid of their offspring. I mean, elks won't do that, horses won't do that, you know, uh, tigers won't do that, only humans. And as our mothers told us, this is a job that goes on forever. Now, at the same time, we belong to a group of, social, of, of animals known as uh, social predators. We hunt in packs to bring down game that none of us would dare attack alone. So in that respect, we're like lion prides and orca pods and wolf packs and dog packs. And the distinguishing characteristics of all the other social predators on the planet is that the females play a leading role in the hunting and the killing. In fact, in hyenas, it's the female that leads the pack. There's one group of social predators where that isn't true, and that's humans. This new transcendent skill called killing was left primarily to the males. And the reason for this is fairly obvious. Where in this scene could you insert a, a nine-month pregnant woman or a nursing mother or a woman responsible for the care and protection of small children? The men primarily became the hunters, and the women primarily became gatherers and taking care of children. Now, in order to build into the nervous system of, of this new predator, you had to build into his nervous system a certain cruelty and cold-heartedness and dispassion. The ability to track and kill something was something new. So the human male began to revel in death, began to enjoy it and take great pleasure in killing things. We now know that we're spreading death and destruction all over the planet and killing all the large animals. If I were to ask this group, which animal on the planet is capable of the most tender acts of mercy and compassion over an extended period of time, you undoubtedly would answer a human being. And then if I asked you which animal is capable of the most vicious, sadistic acts towards another member of the same species over a protracted period of time, you again would answer a human being. Doesn't that seem odd? that we are not only the most compassionate, but we're also the most vicious of all the animals in the, in the animal dump. So supposing you were an engineer, and I assigned you the task of designing a nervous system that could accommodate these two extraordinary extremes of human behavior, how would you do it? Well, I think what you'd do is I think you'd divide these functions into different hemispheres, keep them separate. The modules necessary to look at a pre-verbal infant that's screaming and try to figure out what that baby needs from the tenor of its voice and the, the expression on its face and its body language are located primarily in the right hemisphere of both men and women who are right-handed. The modules necessary to locate, track, and kill another living thing are located primarily in the left hemisphere of uh, both men and women who are right-handed. So I'm going to take a leap here. Everyone here would agree that they have a masculine side and a feminine side. I'm going to give them anatomical mailing addresses. I'm going to say that the right hemisphere is primarily the seat of most of the feminine instincts we have, and the masculine resides in the left hemisphere. Now, the good news is that there's a considerable overlap, and these are two overlapping bell-shaped curves, and not one person exhibits all of these things in one hemisphere or the other. For example, we know that there are many women who make much better hunter-killers than some men. And of course, we also know that there are, some, there are also some, um, some men that make much better nurturers, mother-nurturers than some women, 
But in the main, these divisions hold within individuals, and they hold within uh, couples, and they hold within cultures. Now, another feature of being human is that we have the best eye in the animal kingdom. Yeah, I know. I mean, an eagle can see further, and some animals see better in the dark. But pound for pound, the human eye, if you take all the characteristics of vision, stereoscopic vision, and color vision, and night vision, and distance vision, and visual acuity, humans have the best eye. Now, one of the features of our eyes is that in our retina, we have two different kinds of cells, rods and cones. Rods fill up your entire retina. They give you the big picture. You get to see the slightest movement out in the periphery. You get to see in the dark. You get to see the gestalt. Cone vision occupies less than 1% of the square area of your retina, but gives your eye that incredible visual acuity and distance vision and scrutiny that we allow, allows us to see things in great detail. So if you think about it, the kind of vision that we see with our rods corresponds to the kind of thinking that goes on in the right hemisphere and the converse for the left. So in a way, we have a feminine way to see the world and a masculine way to see the world. We know that women have more rods in their eyes than men. They see better in the dark and they have better peripheral vision. And men have more cones in their eyes than women. They have better distance vision and better focusing at long distances. Now, the other feature of being human is that we're the handed animal. How strange. If you hand a monkey a banana, 50% of the, it doesn't make a distinction. But not so with a human. If you are right-handed, you'll carry out 99% of all fine motor movements with your right hand. You don't trust your left hand. It's kind of clumsy. Well, however, if you hand a baby to a woman, irrespective of whether she's right-handed or left-handed, she'll gather the child up with her left upper extremity. People ward off blows with their left upper extremity. Warriors carry their shield with their left upper. The left hand holds what the right hand picks. So the left upper extremity is kind of a passive, nurturing, and protective extremity in contrast to the right upper extremity, which is the agent of action. When you will yourself to do something, it is your right hand that carries it out. So we humans were now equipped. We had a split brain and a split eye and a split hand. And 70,000 years ago, we immigrated out of Africa, and we traveled all over the world, and we lived as hunter-gatherers, going from hunting ground to hunting ground. And this is the manner in which we lived for hundreds of thousands of years. And then about 8,000 years ago, somewhere, sometime, someplace, somebody noticed that where seeds had dropped around the kitchen midden, when they came back the following year, grain was consistently growing. And they said, you know, if we intentionally plant these seeds and water them, we'll have a guaranteed food supply. So farming was entirely different than foraging because when you plant seeds, you have to take care of your garden. You know, you have to pull the weeds, you have to shoot the crows away, you have to water it. It's a whole different, different thing than just going out in the forest and picking berries. So all of the feminine aspects came to the fore because the verb for tending crops and tending children is the same verb. It's the same function. It's a feminine function. And about the same time, the men were sitting around the campfire one night, and one of them said, um, tell me again why we're chasing these big, dangerous animals that stomp us and gore us to death. I have a much better idea. What do you say we build a little corral, we get a little boy critter and a girl critter, and we put them together, we encourage them to have sex. Sex, 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 sex. And pretty soon we'll have a herd. And then when we want to have dinner, We'll just kind of saunter down to the old corral and kill one of these animals at no risk to ourselves. The other guy looked at him and said, that's a great idea. <laughs> they gave up the hunting life like that and settled down to take care of their flocks and herds. Now, anyone who has ever taken care of a small animal knows that taking care of animals is a lot like taking care of children, isn't it? The verb for raising herds and raising children is the same verb. I mean, you have a hen house, you've got to get up there in the morning and make sure the coyotes don't get them and clean it and feed them and water them. So, so all of the feminine aspects arose to the fore in early farming and husbandry. And you know, in the ancient world, the cosmologies of all these hunter-gatherers consisted of a multiplicity of spirits. But in the early days of agriculture, all of these spirits winnowed down. They become manifest in this one all-powerful deity called the Earth Mother. She had a different name in every culture, but there's not a single culture that we've ever studied where she wasn't a prominent 
a deity to which most people in these early farming communities um, worship. Now, the mythology associated with her is that she had this little puny male consort, this little son, lover, husband, brother, this little guy who managed to get himself killed or murdered every single winter, and it was her job in the spring to resurrect him. And this was the most joyous celebration looked forward to by all early peoples throughout the world. And then, even though these people remained very strongly agricultural and continued to take care of their animals, all over, particularly the Western world, gods and heroes began to murder goddesses to usurp their power. And this went on for several thousand years, and one by one the goddesses were defeated, and eventually um, their power was usurped by the males. And then, with the start of a Western civilization, uh, religions, the gods went down to just one god, and he was indisputably male. So the question I have before you tonight is what event in culture could have been so immense and so pervasive that it changed the sex of God? How did God go from being a woman to a man? Now, there's many different theories about this. Probably the most popular one is the one put forth by Maria Gambutis, uh, a woman uh, archaeologist, who proposes that the horse was domesticated somewhere around 4500 BC on the steppes of Russia, and these rough horsemen came riding out of the north and conquered the goddess-loving people you know, and, and destroyed their, used their, substituted their sky gods for the earth goddess. I have a problem with that theory. That's not what happens in history. Whenever an unsophisticated people conquer a, a, a sophisticated people, the values always flow in the opposite direction. So when the Romans conquered the Greeks within 100 years, they were all worshiping Greek gods and goddesses. The barbarians conquered the Romans, and within 100 years, they were all becoming Christians. So why wouldn't these Kyrgyz horsemen who saw the benefits of the settled life, why wouldn't they worship the goddess? Well, there's many other theories, but to all those I add another. I think it was an inside job. I think that the, the disappearance of the goddess was due to the invention and the discovery of literacy. Now, Sophocles once warned that nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. Do you all agree with that? I mean, if you won the lottery ticket tomorrow, with all that money, you could count on something unpleasant happening. So we would all agree, wouldn't we, that the invention of literacy was vast. So what was the downside? What was the price that we paid to become literate? Now, this book is sort of based on the aphorism of Marshall McLuhan, who said the medium is the message. And by that, he meant that the, the process by which we put out information and take in information is actually more important than the content of the information itself. What a concept. We have a stark shift to patriarchal and misogynist societies with the introduction of literacy. Literacy begins 5,000 years ago in two adjoining civilizations, Egypt and Mesopotamia. The Egyptians invented this fabulous picture writing called hieroglyphics. You had to be a scribe uh, you had to be an artist to be a scribe, and less than 2% of the Egyptians' population could read and write. Next door in Mesopotamia, they invented an even more complicated way to read and write called cuneiform, and less than 1% of their population was literate. Now, there's an old saying that in the valley of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. If you know how to read and write, nobody else does, you will accumulate all the power in a very short period of time. About 3,500 years ago, halfway between Egypt and Mesopotamia, a group of people invented a much simpler way to read and write called the alphabet. The alphabet transformed the world. The alphabet continues to transform the world. And the reason why is that alphabets are so simple that a four-year-old can learn how to read the alphabet. Forrest Gump can learn how to read the alphabet. And the reason I consider that reading and writing are so very different from listening and speaking is that as I'm speaking to you right now, two things are going on. Your left hemisphere is following what I'm saying in a very linear, sequential fashion. If you don't remember what I said from a few minutes ago, you can't follow the thread of this argument. But at the same time, you're watching me. You're checking me out. You want to see if I have dandruff on my shoulders or alcohol on my breath. If the whole time you were talking, I was talking to you, I was drumming my fingertips on the tabletop, your peripheral vision would pick that up, and that would go into the message here. I mean, how many times have you been talking to somebody and they're agreeing with you, they're going, this is the message. 
We all tuned into the presidential debates, not because we didn't know what these guys were going to say. We wanted to see how they said it. The Chinese have an aphorism, let us draw closer to the fire that we might better be able to see what we were saying. So to listen to somebody, there has to be a lot of cross traffic going back and forth across your brain to evaluate the message. Now, when you speak, when I speak, broke his area in my left hemisphere is stitching these sentences that I'm saying right now. But to articulate speech, I need the cooperation of both sides of my lips, tongue, and vocal cords. If I've been to the dentist and had Novocaine, I had trouble talking. So to speak and listen, you must use both of your hemispheres. When you write, you write with only one hand. Up until the invention of the keyboard typewriter, for 5,000 years, it didn't matter whether you were a man or a woman writing. It didn't matter what you were writing about. It didn't matter what language you were writing in. The, the hand that held the writing implement is the same hand that hurls spears, swings swords, and pulls triggers. You could take your left hand and put it in your pocket while you're writing, because you don't even need it. When you read, you read only with the cones of your eyes. You follow that page. You're, you're not interested in what's at the bottom of the page. You're going to get there. Rod vision is cut out of the equation. And when you're reading a scientific article, a legal contract, or the business page, your left hemisphere is all lit up, and your right hemisphere on a PET scan is not. Even when you read fiction and poetry, which is more dependent on imagery, it is still principally your left hemisphere that lights up on an MRI scan or a PET scan. So what would be the effect on culture of introducing a radical new means to communicate that reinforced the masculine hand, the masculine part of the eye, and the masculine part of the brain? It unbalances the brain. Now, this is a piece of conceptual art. And if you were in a museum standing before it, what you would see is a real chair. And off to one side, you would see the, the image of the chair. And off to the other side, you would see the written definition of the chair. We, particularly in the West, have developed an artificial means to reconstruct reality. And it's very seductive. And it's seductive because we line up these 26 meaningless little squiggles and we put them in a certain order, and poof, meaning emerges. What a concept. And then we line up some more of them, and pretty soon we build towering fortresses of constitutional law and religious systems and, and, and philosophical systems, and unfortunately, dogmas for which we're willing to murder each other over for. We fail to notice that we traded an ear for an eye. And I maintain that any culture that adopts an alphabet goes through a period of demonstrable madness where they, um, they denigrate women. And the reason why is the left hemisphere doesn't particularly like the right hemisphere. And if you give it more power, what it tends to do is try to put down the right hemisphere. And this manifests itself by taking away women's rights, an abhorrence of image information, and the disappearance of the goddess. Now, this is the thesis of this book. Let's check out and see what happened in history. The first book ever written in an alphabet was the Old Testament, 900 BC. And the first, the most important part of the Old Testament are the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is the most revolutionary sentence ever transcribed. I am the Lord thy God, there is no other. Now, the Bible doesn't actually state whether this deity is masculine or feminine. But all of the nouns and adjectives used to describe this deity, our Lord, ruler, host, king of the universe, they're all masculine. So it's safe to assume this is a male deity. And if he's the only one that created the universe, what the first commandment states is that there was no woman involved in the creation of the world. Up until this time, there was no people in the world that ever believed that a man alone could create the universe. It was usually a woman alone or two women together or a man and a woman, but never a man alone. Now supposing, I laid out the Ten Commandments on the, on the table up here, on, the, on this stage, and asked each of you to come up and order them in the sequence of importance for your life today. I have no doubt that every single person here would put as number two, don't murder. Not number two. The second most important rule of righteous living is make no images. Now, for those who want to argue with me and say, oh, well, that's about graven images, read the commandment states, thou shalt not create any images of anything that flies in the air, 
creepeth in the ground or is under the sea. In other words, no art. So my question to you tonight would be, why is art more dangerous than murder? Why is no art number two and no murder number six? The second culture in the world that enthusiastically adopt the alphabet were the Greeks. And you can almost hear the Greek men rewriting their mytho-history to disempower women. Greece had three very potent goddesses, Hera, uh, Athena, and Aphrodite. Here you see Hera being gobbled down by her father at the moment of her birth, along with her brothers and sisters. Zeus escapes, comes back, kills the old man, slits open his belly, and outsprings all of the siblings, including Hera, who is now a fully grown woman ready to be Zeus's wife. This is the birth of Athena, who emerges straight out of the forehead, the split brain of Zeus, fully armed, fully grown, ready to do battle. And this is the birth of Aphrodite, a beautiful, nubile, sexy woman arising in a shower of mist from the sea, ready to have sex. So let's step back for a minute. The three most potent goddesses of ancient Greece, none of them had childhoods, none of them had mothers, and none of them emerged into the world by way of a woman's birth canal. What better way to denigrate the value of the feminine than to subtract these three critical essences from your three most potent goddesses? Now, Greece had two very famous city-states that you're all familiar with, uh, Sparta and Athens. Sparta was a fascist, militaristic state, and not one person here has ever read anything written by a Spartan because they left zero written record. Right next door were the Athenians, and God, they loved the written word. They gave us Plato and Thucydides and Sophocles and Euripides. They sat around and discussed the merits of democracy and the aesthetics of art. So if I ask this group, which one of these two uh, cultures treated women better, you'd probably say the Athenians, but you'd be wrong. The Athenians passed a law that stated that women could not own property, which of course is the key to power in any society. They couldn't be publicly educated. They couldn't participate in public life. Right next door, the Spartan girls could compete in the games. They led armies. They owned property. So if I asked you, what was the major differences between Sparta and Athens, you'd have to say, well, number one, uh, their attitude towards the written word, and two, uh, their attitude towards uh, women. You can follow the descent of women in ancient Greece by examining the attitudes of the three most famous philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Socrates, as best we know, wrote nothing down. He refused to debate anybody that used notes. He said the way to get to the truth is to look somebody in the eye and debate them one on one, and that's the way you arrive at the truth. Socrates held very egalitarian attitudes towards women. Plato, who wrote down what Socrates said, wasn't nearly as magnanimous. He said, eh, well, you know, women could still be guardians of the state, but they had to be under the control of the male guardians. And then he had some very misogynist things to say about women in some of his other writing. And of course, Aristotle, who presided over Athenian culture when they became substantial literate, was an unremitting misogynist. He said, women are an inferior species. They should always be under the control of men. Now, Rome conquered Greece. And thanks to their extremely clean Latin alphabet, the Romans achieved near universal literacy in a very short period of time. We know this because Pompeii was destroyed in 79 AD. And when we excavated the city, we found written all over the walls of the city, literate graffiti by the underclass. If the underclass is writing literate graffiti, it's fair to say this society has reached near universal literacy. Does it not seem strange that this is the moment in history when a new religion bursts on the scene as if from out of nowhere, based on the exceedingly wise words of the gentle prophet Jesus? And what Jesus has to say is very feminine. He said, turn the other cheek, the meek shall inherit the earth, the last shall be first. Women flocked to this new religion. They became ministers and priests. They baptized. Uh, Paul thanks women wherever he goes on his missions. Women enjoy these extraordinary prerogatives in the new Christian church until a signal event. And that event was the transcription of Jesus' oral words into the West's second alphabetic sacred text called the New Testament. And within a very short period, the women were told they could no longer baptize. Then they were told they had to sit in the back of the church. And by the 3rd and 4th century, the religion had been taken over by a group of men known as the patriarchs, who wrote long, dense, imageless tomes that changed the original message of Jesus, which was about love and kindness and forgiveness, to one that increasingly emphasized sin, guilt, suffering, and death. Now, one of the first acts of the 
uh, Orthodox Christians, when they became the state religion in 313 AD, was to send their minions into the streets with instructions, destroy all the Greek or Roman images. Destroy not just graven images, knock the noses off and the arms off, destroy every image you can find. Then they shut down the goddess temples. Early Christian art depicts Jesus walking around carrying a book in his hand. Nowhere in the New Testament does Jesus walk around carrying a book in his hand. In fact, as best we know, Jesus wrote nothing down. Isn't that odd? Here he was, born into a culture that revered the written word, in an empire that was enamored with the written word, and he told his disciples to memorize what he had to say. The Buddha wrote nothing down. Pythagoras wrote nothing down. Socrates wrote nothing down. We now think that Confucius wrote nothing down. What was it about these exceptional leaders that seemed to understand that the message changes when it gets written? What happened next is extraordinary. Rome collapses and with it literacy got lost. And in Western Europe for 400 years known as the Dark Ages, less than 1% of the population could read and write. The only books that existed remained in monasteries all locked up. There were a few monks that knew the art. This was a time of extraordinary superstition, barbarity, travel. It was very dangerous. Commerce drive through a trickle. Strife was the order of the day. Wouldn't you think that this would be a period where women's rights would be totally suffocated? So when the stage of history gets reilluminated again in the ninth century, should we not be surprised to find that all over Europe there are male troubadours singing the praises of women? Courtly love, the chivalric code? Women Christian mystics are hailed by the church as having the clear uh, route to the kingdom of heaven than the male clerics. But the most ast women ab abbesses led the monasteries all over northern Europe. But the most astonishing thing was that the people of Europe began to expend these enormous sums of time, energy, and money erecting these fabulous cathedrals dedicated to Notre Dame. Now, wait a minute. Where did Mary come from? Mary's mentioned eight times in the New Testament. She's a peripheral, peripheral character in the whole story. And yet, during the medieval period, she becomes the central figure of Christianity. Mary doesn't say anything. There's no Gospels according to Mary. But it is her image that is everywhere. She leads every procession. She's at every crossroad. She's on shop walls and church names. The, the phenomenon of the rise of Mary ascends in the high Middle Ages. And then, I believe, if you travel in a wide arc from Poland to Spain, you'll find a church somewhere that has its most sacred object, a black Madonna. Now, let's think about this. Why would a Caucasian population, substantially blonde and blue-eyed, what are they doing venerating a black Madonna? And I think the answer to that question is that the earth goddess manifestations was always black. Not always, but nearly always. Athena was black. Artemis was black. Kali was black. Um, the phenomenon of the Black Madonna began to wane in the high Middle Ages, and then the Renaissance began. This testosterone-driven surge of male creative energy that brought forth a lot of science and art and global exploration. But it was fueled by what Life magazine called the most important invention of the last thousand years, Gutenberg's printing press, 1453. Literacy rates had risen into the mid-teens and then Gutenberg invented his press, books multiplied exponentially, and they became cheap, easy, and available. Everyone rushed to learn how to read and write because they all wanted to read this book that they'd heard so much about that they'd never read before called the New Testament and the Old Testament. Now, the New Testament is undoubtedly about love and kindness and forgiveness, right? So wouldn't you think that people reading this book for the first time would behave towards each other in a very loving, kind, and forgiving fashion? Not what happened. The first thing that happened was the Protestant Reformation, led by an extraordinarily harsh group of patriarchal men who basically said, you know, we want to reform this religion. And high on our list of reforms is we want to get rid of Mary, and we want to destroy all the images. So they went into the Catholic churches, and they slashed the paintings, they smashed the statues, and they whitewashed the churches. And then, after they were finished, they stood around and dressed only in black and white, because those were the colors they had it were allowed to wear. They dressed in black and white, and they read from a black and white text. We humans have a bestial streak in us, and periodically we mount up and ride over the mountain pass and attack the people on the other side. But the one thing we have never done is we've never killed our neighbors in large numbers. Suddenly, all over Europe, next-door neighbors were murdering their next-door neighbors. 
In France, the Huguenots and the Catholics killed each other with unbelievable ferocity. In England, the Anglicans killed the Presbyterians and the Puritans killed the Anglicans. In Germany, the Calvinists and the Lutherans were killing each other until the Thirty Years' War started. And then the, the Catholics and the Protestants squared off and they destroyed the economic base of that country for a hundred years. One third of the population of Germany perished in that religious war. In Spain, the Catholics had lived side by side with Jews and Moors for centuries. And suddenly they decided they couldn't tolerate it another minute and they either had to kill them or expel them. If you're looking for this period of history in the history books, you'll find it under the heading, the age of reason. <laughs> I kid you not, this is the period when global exploration and science and art were making major advances. But evidence that some new factor was driving this culture crazy was the fact that the men of this culture suffered a psychosis so extreme that they thought their women were so dangerous they needed to murder them. And murder them they did in very large numbers. The witch hunts did not occur in the Dark Ages. They didn't occur in the bubonic plagues. They occurred smack dab in the middle of the Gilded Renaissance. There has never been an adequate explanation as to why the men of Europe turned on their women. The witch hunts were the most severe in those countries that experienced the steepest rise in literacy. Germany, France, England, um, Switzerland, they had terrible witch hunts. Russia, which we made essentially illiterate, didn't have any witch hunts. Hungary and Bosnia, which were under Muslim rule, they didn't have any witch hunts. If you were to go to a Polynesian or a Kung or, or an Inuit and say, say, would you believe that there's a culture in the world where the men are murdering their wise women? They'd look at you in disbelief. They'd say, that's the stupidest thing you ever heard of. Everybody knows the men are supposed to go to the next village and kill the men there and steal the women, but you never kill your own women. <laughs> this went on for 200 years. There's never been an adequate explanation for why sophisticated Europe, the only culture in the world that died with a knife and a fork, sunk to this uh, incredible depravity. Now, this being a 45-minute lecture, we're going to skip to the 19th century because two things changed all that. One was the in, uh, discovery of electromagnetism, and the other one was the invention of photography. Photography did for images what the printing press had done for the written word, made them cheap, easy, and available. By the end of the 19th century, there was virtually no one who had not sat for their photograph at least once. In the 200 years after the Protestant Reformation, if you said to somebody, your house is on fire and you can run in and retrieve one personal object, what would it be? The answer would be the family Bible. Within one generation of the invention of photography, the answer changed, and you all know what you would run in your home to retrieve if you could only get one thing. Now, electromagnetism and photography began to interweave, bringing forth new forms of communication. The first one was film. Film attendance surpassed church attendance within six years of its introduction, and it's never been close since. Now, everyone here in this room was educated in the Western manner. It's called reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's taught in a very linear, sequential fashion, it starts in kindergarten, goes right on up through college. We're all taught that way. And then in the 1950s, a new form of communication mixed with photography to bring forth television. Television was so radical, it required a different hemispheric strategy to see television. And by that I mean, if you attach EEG leads to somebody's brain and you give them a book to read, any book, doesn't matter what the subject is, they generate beta waves. Beta waves are what you generate when you're concentrating on a task. If you ask the person to look up from their book and start watching a television program, any television program, doesn't matter, sex and violence, cuddly koala bears, you know, the news, doesn't matter. The beta waves go away and alpha and theta waves come up. Alpha and theta waves are what you generate when you meditate. Who here has not had the experience of going home, settling into the couch after a hard day's work, taking that clicker in your hand, and going into a trance? <laughs> When people are asked, what is the experience of watching television like, the word most commonly used is hypnotizing. Now in a world that has one television set for every two people on the planet, how could that not make a profound difference? We now get such a profound amount of our information from images that we have a visual archive in our brain. If I say to you, little girl, naked, running down, I don't have to finish the sentence. You know what I'm talking about. These images have so much power to change consciousness. 
You know, Western culture for 2,000 years has been moved by long, imageless tomes written by esteemed white males. Plato, Aquinas, Augustine, Marx, Hegel, Freud. I challenge anyone in this audience to name a single book written in the last 50 years since television that begins to have the power to change consciousness as this image, or more importantly, this image. Now, electromagnetism and photography combine once again to bring forth another means of communication based on images called the personal computer and the internet. It is feminizing the world. The reason I say that is that for 5,000 years, the only way you could write was to write with one hand. At the end of the last century, the typewriter was invented, and you had to type with both hands. But the problem was, is that only women learned how to type. They were all the typists taking dictation from the bosses. The personal computer gets invented in the 70s, and all the men rushed to learn a skill that their grandfathers considered was for sissies, called typing. <laughs> so, 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 so let's ask a question here. What is the effect on culture of having millions of men's left hands connected to millions of men's right brains tapping out one half of every written message? We've now witnessed an extraordinary change in the last 50 years since television with an amazing rise in women's rights. I think that we are witnessing the end of a 5,000 year reign of patriarchy and misogyny brought on to a large extent by the introduction of alphabet literacy. And women, <laughs> and women are now reclaiming the rights that they once had and took for granted a long time ago. Women are priestesses again in all the major religions except one, and that's going to change soon. Men are better fathers today to their children than they were 100 years ago, and they're better husbands to their wives than they were. So, of course, this is happening so rapidly that there's great dislocations in our culture, and the lower 20% of men who are insecure with their masculinity to begin with are very unhappy about this shift of power because the women are gaining it and the men are losing it. And nobody ever gives up power willingly or easily. So you can expect a rise in rape statistics, domestic violence, sex and violence in movies and films. It's all part of a manifestation of what's really going on, which is a massive shift in a rise of the feminine and a fall of the masculine. Now, I believe that this is going to continue. So in summary here, let me just, uh, supposing we plot the rise and fall of the goddess for 5,000 years, and we plot the rise and fall of sacred art for 5,000 years. And then we plot that against the rise and fall of alphabet literacy in 5,000 years. What we see is that these two graphs run counterpunctually. Now, I don't want to leave anyone to leave here saying, that Schlein guy said nobody should read anymore. <laughs> um, reading is a invaluable skill that gives you access to information you would have a very hard time accessing in any other way. And at the same time, um, I also believe that Western culture in particular has been stuck for too long in a yang, beto, macho, left hemispheric mode. And we need to have more balance in our culture and within each individual. Now, I hope that this presentation has produced this response. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 You talked a lot about the evolution of human communication and creativity. Where do you think we're going in the future? Um, I think I can illustrate that best by uh, showing how hominids evolved. Two and a half million years ago, one of our ancestors, known as Homo habilis, had a one-pint brain. And one of our ancestors looked in a riverbed and saw a rock and picked up this rock and stared at it for a real long time with a one-pint brain and imagined that there was a tool inside the rock. What a concept. And this person very patiently chipped at the edge of this rock until they got a sharp edge. They made exactly the same tool for 800,000 years. They never varied it. And then along came Homo erectus, who had a two-pint brain. And Homo erectus looked at the tool that Homo habilis had made and said, 
You know, if you turn the sucker over and hit it alternately on both sides, you get a really sharp edge. They made the same bifacial hand axe for a million years. They never varied it. And then along came Homo sapiens with a three-pint brain. And we made some slightly better tools in the beginning, and then you know, we, we moved out of Africa 70,000 years ago. And then 40,000 years ago, something amazing happened called the Great Leap Forward of the Upper Paleolithic Revolution. We started to create representational art, consistently bury our dead, practice ritual, make beautiful grave goods. And then 30,000 years ago, we invented the um, fish hook and the sewing needle. And then 15,000 years ago, we invented the bow and arrow. And then 8,000 years ago, we, we discovered agriculture. And 5,000 years ago, we invented writing. And 200 years ago, we had the Industrial Revolution. And 50 years ago, we had the Technological Revolution. So if you made a graph of human innovation, or hominid innovation, it would be a flat line going two and a half million years that would suddenly turn into this. Now, we know that in science, this cannot go on indefinitely. One of two things have to happen. Either the graph collapses, which we all know we're in danger of, or the object being studied changes state like that. If there was a caterpillar crawling across this podium, and I said to you, would you believe that this caterpillar is going to turn into a butterfly? And you didn't know that that could happen. You say, that's impossible. But it happens all the time in nature. It's called metamorphosis. In physics, it's called a phase change. In biology, it's called metamorphosis. And in evolution, it's called punctuated equilibrium. Species change just like that. You can take water, and you can heat water, and you can heat water. It's still water. You raise it one more degree, and it's not water anymore. So why would we think that we're finished as a species? We are only 150,000 years old. All species on the planet live, in general, about a million to a million two before they either go extinct or become something else. So at 150,000 years, we're, we're like about 10 years old or 12. And if you read the newspapers, we're behaving like that. You know, we're, we're, we're strong enough that we're starting to be dangerous to each other, but we're also starting to develop a moral uh, a sense of, of right and wrong. So I think that the limit of human intelligence was set by the diameter of the female's pelvis. You simply could not jam a bigger brain baby through that little bony hole. So what we did to solve the problem is we started adding peripherals to our brain outside of our brain. The first peripheral was language. The next one was libraries and writing. Then we started adding cell phones and telescopes and radios and television. Every one of these things allows us to communicate with each other to a larger audience over greater distances in less time. So what we, the reason that my computer is colored gray is that it happens to be a piece of my brain sitting on the desk. It's just not wet. So, so what we've been doing is we've been adding silicone-based products to our skull that are outside of our skull, so we don't have to have this big brain, but we're increasing our computing capacity, our, our memory capacity, all of our communications ab abilities are increasing exponentially. And I believe that we are changing as we speak into a different kind of animal. Now, we're not going to grow, we're not going to have physical changes, but we're changing in terms of a transformation that has never been seen in evolution before. And, um, you know, it's very difficult to notice that the clothes are getting cleaner when you're in the inside of a spinning washing machine. And that's where we are right now. Question over here. <clears throat> While I was reading this book, I continually wished for at least one diagram that would help me see what you were saying all at once. And on the pictures, you just briefly showed exactly that. And what I was wondering is, did the publisher object to including such a thing in the book? Well, this presentation is the right brain version of the left brain book. Okay? <laughs> the publisher, I'll tell you a cute story. That the, I originally wanted 85 images in the book. The book is about images, right? So. They said, um, okay, we'll give you 85 images. And I, you know, and, uh, and the writer is responsible for getting the permissions to, to do the images. So I remember I wanted this image from Crete, and I was, they only turned their fax machine on and one hour in the morning. I had to get up in the wee hours to fax this woman and get these permissions. And I got all these 85 images, and the book came out, it was 560 pages long. And the publisher said to me, 
No one wants to read a book over 500 pages. You must cut 80 pages from this book, and you must do it in a week, or you're going to miss your publication date. I said, 80 pages? If I cut 80 pages out of the book, I mean, the book, I'll have to rewrite the book. They said, sorry, that's what you have to do. So if I cut an image out of the book, I got a half a page. <laughs> so here I was, hoisted on my own petard, okay? I'd written a book about image. The subtitle of the book is The Word Versus Image. And I had to decide what paragraphs I could eliminate, what stories I could eliminate, and which images I could eliminate. And the book ends up with 33 images. And I came in at 486 pages. So I got under the wire. And I made the publication date. <laughs> but in this, in this present, kind of a presentation, I can show all of these images that I really would like to have shown in the book. Hey. Um you mentioned that the Renaissance and uh, classical Greece and Athens, they were uh, times of, of, of high literacy, but um, also, uh, weren't they also great booms of art, visual arts, like Leonardo da Vinci and yeah. all these other great artists and visual? Yes, there's no, there's no contradiction there. The fact that, you know, that uh, whenever, uh, whenever a new form of communication enters a culture, the culture explodes. It's happened, if you look throughout history, when writing first began, Mesopotamia, Egypt, just burgeoned. When the Gutenberg printing press, every, everywhere Gutenberg's printing press has gone, the culture has gone through a tremendous revival of the arts and a tremendous increase in strife. So again, it's that Sophoclean aphorism, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. So the fact that artists were uh, emboldened to create this fabulous art isn't a contradiction. The Middle Ages were a horrible time. There were, there were war after war. People were fighting each other nonstop. The Hundred Years' War. It's it's you know it has it's it's almost not been surpassed. Interestingly history. enough, they didn't burn women then. Wouldn't you think that after three bubonic plagues and a Hundred Years' War, that the 14th century should have been the time when women should have suffered the most? There weren't any witch hunts. The witch hunts occurred later when things were really kind of going good. There was the Renaissance, and although there were these religious wars, most people's lives were a lot better then than they were then, were, were in the Middle Ages. Just to follow up on that gentleman's question, when you go to Florence or Venice and you walk through the museums, what you see is that Botticelli, whom you showed, and Raphael, and Bellini, and Michelangelo and da Vinci and the others are painting the Virgin again and again. I mean, this, you, maybe you've already answered the question, but I mean, it does seem that while they're discovering perspective, they're also very much attuned to the Madonna image. Well, they were, they were commissioned. You must remember that there was only one patron in the Renaissance, and that was the church. There was some, you know, some people could commission portraits, but in general, the church was the one that was giving out the most commissions. And to a large extent, you know, it's interesting that Pope Gregory was the one that, that um, dismissed the Second Commandment because it was clear that people couldn't read and write in, in the, right after the Dark Ages. And if there were no images, how on earth were they going to disperse the knowledge of Christianity? So he said, it's okay to make images, thank God, because now we have all this art, which we wouldn't have had if they would have strictly adhered to the, 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 the Ten Commandments. And then the church was, was regulating what was painted. And Mary was rising in the church um, it, it, during the Renaissance to the point where um, many of the commissions that were assigned, like Leonardo was commissioned, okay, you have to paint the Virgin on the Rocks or the, the, the Holy Family. And so they were told what, what subjects were to be painted. It wasn't like the artist said, I think I want to paint a, a Madonna and child. The thing that strikes me up until uh, Leonardo is how unrealistic the Madonna and Child paintings were. I mean, uh, in most, of the, most of the paintings, the, Mary is holding the baby in a way that no woman ever holds a baby. You know, it's the iconic thing. She's got an expression on her face of such dourness that you wonder, did she look happy having a baby? I mean, you know, that, it wasn't until Leonardo that he actually painted a Madonna who was actually laughing and smiling with her baby, you know. Question here? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. I'm wondering if you can speak to um, the argument that literacy led to patriarchy, um, specifically with the writing of the Old Testament. It with, with seems the, I'm that. I'm sorry, with the what? 
uh, specifically with the writing of the Old Testament, uh, it seems like more than prescribing patriarchy, it's describing it insofar as God is always imaged as right-handed because culturally to be left-handed um, was not acceptable. In the same way, I think that um, that masculine images for God are more prominent in the in the Old Testament and New Testament, although there are, I think, female um, metaphors for God because they're describing something already going on in culture. So language and reality, can you speak to, to that relationship? Yeah, the, the prejudice against right-handers, against left-handers, is pervasive in all cultures in the world. You, you can find the evidence of it in every single culture. Um, <clears throat> isn't it interesting that all of the Western deities don't have an image. I mean, you know, Yahweh doesn't have an image. Allah doesn't have an image. Look at this cartoon thing that, that blew up because they made images. And, and, you know, supposing, isn't it odd that in the New Testament, with all the detail about what Jesus did and where he went and who he talked to and what he said, that there's not a single line in the entire book that describes what he looked like. How could the Gospel writers leave out something that's important. We don't know if he was short or tall, whether he was dark, with blue eyed. We, we have no idea. There's not a physical description of him. Now, supposing I handed you a photograph and one third of the photograph was torn. And in the remaining two thirds of the photograph, there was an older man with his arm draped protectively around a young boy. And I said, What do you think's going on in this photograph? And you'd say, Well, it looks like a father and a son. And I said, Who do you think is the missing person in the third? Is there anybody that wouldn't answer the mother? But in Christianity, the Trinity consists of a father, a son, and another guy. I mean, the Holy Ghost. And, and it's very interesting about language because you have this phenomenon that when the first New Testament was written, it was written in Aramaic, and the word for spirit is breath in Aramaic. It means, and the word is ruach. And, and it's a feminine noun. And all of the Hebrew prayers begin with baruch. You know, it's breath. So when it gets translated into the Greek um, New Testament, the word spirit gets translated into um, pneuma, which is air, you know, pneumonia, or pneumonitis, or pneumatic. And, and it, it turns out that in Greek, that's a neutral noun. It doesn't have masculine or feminine. So then... Um, the Vulgate gets translated, and Jerome has a choice between two Latin words. He can use spiritus, which is a masculine noun, or he can use anima, which is a feminine noun, which means soul. He chose spiritus. And on the basis of choosing spiritus, which is a masculine noun, the Trinity becomes three masculine entities rather than two masculine entities and a feminine one. And on such minor hinges are, are the fate of and how things play out in religion over many centuries. Um, I feel like I may be reiterating something that might have already been said, but um, just to pound it a little more, um, having lived in Florence for eight months and having spent quite a bit of time in the Uffizi, um, you can see that most of the art is not only feminine in the early Renaissance, but it's also even more feminine and even more goddess-centered in the high Renaissance. And further, having seen um, the Byzantine art that was actually made during the Dark Ages, it's, it's actually from that period that most of the dour and iconic images of Mary existed in the first place. So to, so to say that the, um, the people in the early Renaissance were making inaccurate images of womanhood and it not only ending with Leonardo, it's not to say that they were, but to say that the Byzantines were, which were people that were making well, there, art there of Mary were, I, in the I, Dark yeah, Ages. I'm, being, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Because <laughs> sorry. It's much more iconic. You're absolutely right. It, they're not painting a true representation of a, of a, of a human female. They're painting an idea uh, of, a, of an iconic image. And many of the, for example, the Eastern Orthodox icons you know, of Mary, and, it's a different it's a different kind of art. I, your point is well taken. I tend to get carried away when I have to have given a lecture and I get all that applause, I tend to get carried away. So, you know, so. Hey, we have time for uh, maybe one more question.
You've talked a lot about the West. Can you talk about the same phenomenon in the East? Does yes. It exist? Um, I have four chapters in the book devoted to Eastern religions and Eastern forms of writing. Um, I maintain that any, any form of writing pushes a culture towards patriarchy and misogyny. You know, the Chinese culture is 5,000 years in length, very rich culture. If I were to ask you, what is the most misogynist thing that the Chinese men did to their women, you undoubtedly would answer foot binding. When do you think in this 5,000 year period was the first example of foot binding in Chinese history? It occurs in the first generation after the invention of the printing press in the Song Dynasty in the ninth century. So that suddenly this thing takes off. And, and if you think about it, what was happening to the women's feet is the women's feet were being crushed. The printing press worked in China that you put a piece of paper in the press and you wound the press down and you crushed the paper until the ink was transferred to the paper. The thing that was crushing the women's feet were strips of white linen, which the, the uh, and it turns out that the Chinese invented paper and they, they used white linen for their paper. So how did an invention that spread literacy throughout China metaphorically transfer over to become this agent that left women infantilized. You know, we say in our society that a person isn't an adult until they can stand on their own two feet. Well, here they were making it so that women couldn't stand on their own two feet. They were keeping them as children, and they felt that that was sexy. So, so I address the, the whole issue of what happened in the East um, in the book, which, of course, I couldn't go into in just a short period like this. One more question. I wanted to ask you a little bit about sort of what the goal of your project is in a way, because I hear from sort of how you're looking at the world today, you seem to think that um, sort of integrating the masculine and feminine is a good idea. Do you worry, though, that by looking at history and in, in sort of dichotomizing both in terms of culture and history and art and even the human brain, a kind of masculine and feminine, that you're sort of reifying those uh, and reinforcing those cultural categories rather than um, well, it is, it is looking at them in a more yeah. sort of fine-grained way. Yeah, it is a problem, but I mean, you know, it, it's, it's like Sigmund Freud said that if, before you can change, you have to understand what the problem is. You know, you, can't, you have to go back and go back into your history to understand it. And I, I felt that I needed to write this book because I felt that in all the discussion about male-female relations, this was one that was being, this was a factor that, that no one, to my knowledge, up until the time I wrote it, had ever brought to the fore. So many people challenged me after I wrote the book and said, well, surely you can't be saying that literacy is the cause of all patriarchy. And I said, well, of course not. So I felt compelled to write a sequel to this book called Sex, Time, and Power, How Women's Sexuality Shaped Human Evolution, where I go back even further to examine why is it that of the three million sexually reproducing species on this planet, we do it differently than all the other species. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're a wasp or a tiger, mm -hmm. they, all, they all do it, they all get it on the same way. The right. female has a distinct season, call it heat, estrus, rutting. She gives off a real clear signal that the males can't possibly miss. They come from all over, they fight among each other, and then the male mates with the female at the precise moment that the female releases her eggs and the next generation is conceived. What could be more straightforward and simpler than that? Does any man in this audience have any idea where the, where the woman sitting next to her, where she is in her menstrual cycle? <laughs> I mean, does the, the, do the women know? They got to go to Walgreens and buy a thermometer because they're not even sure. So what possible evolutionary advantage could there have been to our species to lose the single most uh, simple gene replicating system that's used by all the other animals? And the book goes into a whole bunch of other issues that, about humans to examine why we structured our society that men are patriarchal and misogynistic towards women in so many cultures throughout history. So you're looking at the evolutionary view, the biological view, and the cultural right. view and trying to right. somehow right. put those together. Right. Interesting. But uh, you have to cut it, you have to, you have to kind of be a scientist and look at the parts of it before you can put them back together again. And I know that your, your criticism is well taken that being dichotomizing and categorizing, there's the danger of losing the big picture, but I try not to do that. <laughs>